for those at home watching nautiluslive.org, uh, we are aware that the live data on the side is not streaming, even though you can see the quad feed. Uh, this is something that we're aware of and working on from land. First hour of our watch done. Pretty bad form formation. Yeah, it's interesting. It's showing a, a down slope flow, so the um, current is coming off the the table mount top on the flat area of the geo and flowing downhill here as the vehicle passes through, looking due south. Um, it's definitely a, a down down slope flow. Um, which kind of makes sense given the transitions in the sediment grain size we saw on the transit up here, where you've got um, the stronger current up here is winnowing the finer sediments out. And then as the current starts dying um, or becoming less strong as we get deeper, it settles out the finer grain stuff, which is apparently tastier or easier for um, the detritivores to eat, given how many we saw of them downhill. So we probably you actually did like a grain size analysis, I suspect you would see a pretty consistent winnowing um, of going from coarser grains on top to finer grains um, with depth, almost like you would be looking through um, the pattern of a turbidite. It's not one, but um, it would have a similar kind of pattern to it. So I thought it was whenever you see a seamount or a geo, it was causing nutrients to, to up well from like the bottom currents, so it could also be surface currents coming down. Sure, so it could be coming, um, so it depends on the direction of flow. What I'm assuming right now is that the predominant flow is coming out of the northwest, probably upwelling on the west or north faces, flowing over the top of the feature and then downwelling or creating rotors, turbulence, on the lee side of the feature. Um, and given what we're seeing right here, I'm, I'm operating on the assumption that this is the lee side of the feature. Awesome, thank you. But again, another plug for better current monitoring on ROVs and cheaper, easier to deploy current monitors so that we can better understand the flow across of these features, because I think that's going to be critical for the next iteration of understanding the distribution of, of corals and sponges is having a much better mechanistic understanding of the current flow across these features and what animals really like what different flow regimes. This little Calafaca sponge we're looking at here as we're moving up this next um, little pillow rift or whatever you want to call it. What do you call a pillow mound? Coralie, does it have a specific term, name? Pillow mound. Pillow hummock, pillow mound, pillow yeah, rift. Yeah, I've definitely heard that before. Okay. And are these just, uh, basically, it's just a vent that builds up and makes these things. I'm used to seeing them and are often seeing them in these kind of moundy distributions like this. Should we try to pick up a rock here, or? If, if we see any rocks, yeah, we can do that. But I haven't seen anything that looks not cemented or, or flat. Uh, we were discussing it. 
Um, but when was, Chris, can you look at when the last rock was collected? I was asking Chris to look in the sample log when they got the last rock. 1507. 1307. Now let's let's go a little bit further. They were already on the top by then. Comanchula crinoid, little Chrysogorgia, sitting up here on the top of this little tiny local high. Another one of these benthic brittle stars. Some more of these uh, um, brown tunicates. What are, are those xenophilophores? No, they're tunicates. All of them? We, yeah. Whoa, um, we there's got so it. many. We, we've been seeing them now for about 20 minutes. Um, Sorry, I was doing an interaction. No, it's fine. But yeah, we, we picked them up basically as soon as you went in the other room to do <laughs> the interaction. Um, they're a little unusual. I am not used to seeing those here and, and not in the abundance that we're seeing them. Can we take a quick zoom on the whip, please? This is the bamboo coral whip. We haven't been seeing a lot of these, honestly. Um, and then it looks like a little primnoid um, below it. Sea star. Yep. Got a sea star and a five or six crino uh, crinoids. Uh, brittle stars all hanging out together. What's it's that? It's a star party. Can we look at that, please? Two cup corals? Wrong color. Cup corals are almost always pinkish red. like some kind of tufts of hydroids. Yeah, pretty sure those are those are some type of hydroid. All right, thank you.
about how far are we from the summit of this? Um, do, 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 do. Let me change computer screens and I can tell you exactly. Ooh, that is beautiful. So depending on how you define summit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so basically, we're more or less on the top flat part here, or just hovering just off the edge. Um, the feature we dove on yesterday for a shallow water dive, I believe, was the highest point, uh, that little secondary volcanism cone thing. And it is right at 10 kilometers uh, away from us right now, 10 and a half from our current position. So this is a relatively large geot. Yeah, it, it's a good size. Um, it is the better tart of 45 kilometers on the diagonal. Holy moly. So call it 27 by 45 kilometers across the flat part and if it's m and much much further out actually it's really more like 25 by 55 um, and then if you include the whole feature which my map doesn't even zoom out far enough to get back down to the abyssal plain um, it's a quite a large feature you know our three dives on this feature barely come close to covering a, a real percentage of its surface all we can do, all we can really hope is to try a couple of different sides and get a, uh, um, get a representative sample of like each face of it or each like style of slope type. Hmm. Question online is why do we not see bryozoans? And we have seen several bryozoans, haven't we? Um, bryozoans are something we don't know a whole lot about in a lot of ways. Um, and um, so I don't have a good answer for you. I don't know much about them, and they're kind of so rare that we don't have a good... We don't know a lot about them, frankly. Monday morning. Ooh. Every day is a Tuesday. I even have like a checklist to help me like be like, yes, today is Monday. You've been out here for 20 days. But it still hits me sometimes like it is Monday. You can look at it the other way as you haven't had a day off in three weeks. That is true. Our goal is to finish up our photo albums by this evening. So for those of you who have been watching for a little while and saw the bones they collected on the la last watch with the um, Ocidex, most likely with the Ocidex in it, the bone-eating worms, um, there's been a flurry of emails flying back and forth between the ship and the Smithsonian this morning talking about how best to preserve them and whatnot. And we're pretty sure that this is the first observation. It might be some other type of tunicate hanging out on the uh, rocks here around the coral. All right, that's probably good for us. Thanks. Lots of these little benthic tunicate looking things along this rock face. That's kind of cool. Yeah.
the Parasocrinus. Um, uh, Strathcrinoid down there on the left, continuing to see these uh, tunicate things. Nice pillow lava um, formation here. Yeah. Several more crinoids, a couple more stalk sponges. I have to admit, I'm, with this kind of current flow, I'm shocked there's not more right here. For this promontory being up in the water and uh, exposed to as much current as it seems to be right now. all of this seems very volcanic-y to be up on the top of this um, feature. I would have expected to have been well into the carbonate by now. Yeah, I think so. Oh, did we run out? Is that it? <laughs> At the handover, they mentioned that it's been like rock sand, rock sand. Keeps going back and forth. There's a nice Chrysogorgia on the right, just out of frame. I don't know if you got the tether to look at it or not. Right behind the Halosaur. No squat lobster, just a shrimp. These Chrysogorgias almost, um, certainly not always, but the vast majority of the time, have a uh, Eurotychus <coughs> um, squat lobster in them usually. Um, and if they don't have one of those, they have one of those um, red shrimps that this one seems to have.
looks like a got either a little tiny baby coral stalk or a dead stalk with a bunch of brittle stars dead center and then we got a yellow comatulate crinoid over on the right looks like another predatory tunicate swinging in the breeze um, there in the center big fallen sponge sponge stalk Do you want to try to move east to catch whatever Atalanta's seeing up there? Bridge nav. Can we move five zero meters east, please? Thank you. This is like the opposite of our last watch where we just had the same move the entire four hours. <laughs> We're really zigging and zagging wherever I want. <laughs> Deal. Can we look at, um, oops, wrong stylus. That real quick, please. Hey, Steve, have you ever seen tunicates um, quite like this with in this kind of density? This is a little Chrysogorgia here. Um, and then also we've got these, um, all these tunicates that are attached to um, the substrate as well, which is a little bit unusual for me. I don't remember seeing, um, we see these predatory tunicates like you can see here in the top right, fairly commonly, um, but in low density but to see these more traditional filter feeding tunicates, the brown um, blobs, uh, for lack of a better word, all around this coral, uh, it's kind of unusual for me. Um, all right, thanks. Looks like we got a Metallogorgia hanging out here on the right as well. Sure, yeah, if we got if we got time and leash. So I think I was wrong, that actually isn't Metallogorgia, that's a Chrysogorgia. Um that's all I need, thanks. I think you're going to start getting pulled east soon. You're just like being magnetically drawn north today. <laughs> you were the other day going south.
resume whips on the left. This looks like that same whip we were seeing deeper on our last watch. All right, thank you. Uh, are we looking at pillow lava right now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think you are directly in the lee of this big pillow um, basalt mound. So Corley, I know you've talked about it before, but what kind of causes pillow lava versus sheet lava? Um, so it mostly has to do, uh, I think generally people, it's just different flow regimes, but uh, generally viscosity has, oh. Oh, got skill. I didn't get a good enough look at it. I think Halosaur, if I had to guess, but I definitely did not get a good look at it. Sorry, Corley. Got oh, excited no. there. That was, that was it. Just viscosity has like a pretty big effect on the flow regime. And viscosity is a uh, resistance to flow? Mm -hmm. So it looks like we got a, a fairly thick crinoid stalk that has been decapitated and overgrown with hydroids there. So how exactly is it that you know that it has been overgrown with hydroids? Like I was looking at it and I was like, oh, it's some type of coral. And then you're like, nope, crinoid with hydroids. Uh, that's a really good question. And I'm trying to figure out how to articulate it. Um, and I'm struggling to figure out how to articulate it. Uh, so it wasn't fi the stalk wasn't fibrous, so that uh, eliminates a sponge stalk. Um, so some type of coral or crinoid. The color is an, would be an unusual color for a coral. Um, the thickness of it uh, and the fact that it was showing no branching pattern um, kind of probably leans towards crinoid. And then that just fuzzy overgrowth um, this just is really classic hydroid. Um, nice little aggregation of sponges here. Got a couple different, three, at least three different types of sponges. Another couple more um, uh, predatory tunicate and these kind of interesting benthic tenophores we've been seeing. And then looks like one Chrysogorgia back in the back. And a little bathycrinus uh, crinoid as well. I don't need a close look on any of those. Um, if you're at the end of your leash, that's fine. Yeah, you, that's fine. I'm pretty sure I got a good idea on all of those things. We've seen everything else both recently on that rock. Brian, we've been, uh, or you've been talking a, a lot about the meofauna living in the sand. Are any of those critters uh, anaerobic or do they require oxygen? Oh yeah, there's absolutely um, anaerobes down there. Um, so the, uh, <coughs> the sorry, I'm thinking about how to um, articulate this. It's still early in the morning. Um, so in sediment, there are different um, compounds that can be used in respiration, and most of what we do um, is oxygen. So we, you know, break up complex carbons, food molecules, bind it to oxygen, um, and as um, how we do respiration, uh, cellular respiration. And when you get into 
the sediment and oxygen becomes less common, there's a whole host of other compounds that um, bacteria and generally can use um, as the electron receptor um, in that we use oxygen for, and it, I forget what it is right now, um, but it like it's like methane, hydrogen sulfide, um, and eventually carbon dioxide. And there's a whole like redox ladder of preferentially energetically preferential molecules to use uh, in cellular respiration. Mm -hmm. And so as you go deeper in marine sediments, you usually go down. So you find the um, the oxygen breathers in the surface near the water and then it goes down and down and down as you get to less and less desirable but available um you know basic components for cellular respiration and in, in deep sea sediment that's extremely compressed and so you get into anaerobic um, respiration extremely quickly uh, in deep sea sediments fantastic thank you So we now into the, is this a little carbonate section, do you think, Coralie? This looks carbonate to me. Um, I have no idea, unless we broke off a piece, but it does look a little weird. Are there any uh, key telltale signs that make you think it's carbonate versus basalt? Um, if there's no ferromanganese crust on it, the color would be different. One would be black and one would be white. But when there's ferromanganese crust over it, it's can be hard to tell, but sometimes you can see like very clear volcanic structures or um, sedimentary structures underneath. Ooh, that's a beautiful sponge. I believe this is Sacrocalyx. It's got an extremely long stalk on it. With the Parisocrinus right here on the, uh, right next to it. It's a beautiful, beautiful sponge. Does it always get that tall? No, they definitely come in shorter versions too. That's certainly on the tall side. So Corley, going back to what you were saying, uh, basalt versus carbonate. So. Would it be typical to find basalt towards the base of a geo to sea mount and then carbonate up towards the top where there was possibly coral and life? Yeah, exactly. But you can I also have like mass wasting events that'll bring the carbonate down. What is a mass wasting event? Like when you say that, I think of dinosaurs. Uh, mass wasting means kind of like the, there's like a slope failure. So there's, like whatever is on top just kind of gets like thrown to the bottom essentially. So you'll find carbonate areas uh, deeper on seamounts and stuff. Can you transfer that into the sample log for the bone collection? Well, you could think of it as like a landslide or like a mudslide oh, or something. Oh, okay. So kind of what more typical of what we were seeing, was it two nights ago, three nights ago, something like that? But there was like a really steep incline, incline and they're like, oh, this might have been a landslide event. I can't, I can't even I know, all, I the, can't all the dots are starting to blend together. Yeah, or just, you know, to me, not to transfer word for word, but those are the, um, the suggestions on how to preserve the ossidexes in the mm -hmm. bone from last watch. All right, nice little bathopathies here. This is a black coral or an anthropotherian. It's probably the most common of the black corals we see around, out down here. So Dara, I want to throw a question down to you. Um, during ROV dives, you know, you're kind of front and center of 
making sure that the cameras are zooming in, zooming out, that everybody is able to see the satellite feed from home. But you also do a lot outside of those normal ROV dive shifts. What else uh, goes into being, you know, the video engineer, video intern? What else do you have to do outside of the normal ROV dives? One of the main things that we do is we maintain um, cameras outside. Pretty much anything you see on any of the feeds during the day, evening. And one of the things that we kind of do is every morning or, or evening, depending on if the lenses look dirty, we will maintain all the stuff all the cameras that are outside and in the van itself and so that's just a daily um, thing we do is we go and clean them especially when they're outside and you're in the ocean environment you're getting a lot more uh, seawater spray and stuff and it's just a quick maintain maintenance do you have to do anything with the videos on any of the rovs uh, only yeah, if you look at the, look at the bigger ROV. kind of pattern here. So um, there's one camera that I maintain specifically for watching as the RV is launched, but most of the time the ROV team is the one that's maintaining the cameras on the ROV. Yeah, that makes sense. But Thank if you. I'm, but if I'm asked, I'll do it. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Daryl. Yep, no problem. the Central Pacific of them, and the nearest other observation of Ossidex is, is off the coast of California, several thousand miles away. Um, so once we get them under a microscope and get them to the Smith, um, Harvard and the Smithsonian um, to be looked at, um, that'll be a massive range extension for our understanding of where they live. So these were not fossilized whale bones, these were Correct, fresh. Correct, relatively recent. It was a, a bone staged um, animal fall. We're still not sure what the animal is yet. Um, Without seeing the, the bones ourselves, or maybe you've seen them, what is your guess on what they could be? I mean, generally being out here, given the size of what it, it looks like, it, it's gotta be some kind of large predatory fish or mammal. I mean, there's just not that many choices out here for large organisms. Um, it's definitely not a shark. Um, and if it is mammalian, it basically has to be a marine mammal unless something weird happened, like there was a large animal on a ship and it fell overboard or died on board and was cast overboard um, from a ship. But so we've got a couple little interesting things here. And I think Dan read my mind as trying to look up in that crevice to see what is growing in there. This looks like some type of little Chrysogorgia. Again, with my endless question about overhangs of why corals grow, filter feeders grow upside down and overhangs out of the current flow. Um, and then that second type of predatory tunicate, a couple of them here. Little bamboo whip. Good morning, California. Thank you for viewing in.
so when we get back to land what is the first thing that has to be done is it pure personal like can't wait to take a shower can't wait to go home or is it there's still scientific operations that still have to be done so the nice thing about this expedition is we've got a three and a half day transit home uh, or to home to port and so a lot of the craziness that is demobilization and whatnot um, we get to do underway during the transit and also because it's Nautilus and Hercules lives on board. There's a lot. It's not like you're trying to suddenly offload vehicles and have cranes and have massive shipping operations going on like you do if you're on some other vessels that don't have a permanently attached ROV and you're shipping the ROV off or you're shipping all of your supplies home. Um, these dedicated platforms really reduce a lot of the wear and tear because they stay staffed and or supplied um, for this type of operation. You know, if you get off a, a vessel of opportunity, you have to pack up everything. And we're talking tw multiple containers, loads of equipment, stores, vehicles, winches, all those things may have to leave the ship uh, when you pull in port. So demobilizing from Nautilus is way easier than a lot of other platforms. Um, so the big things we'll have to do that are time sensitive is just pack up um, all the samples um, and get them ready for long-term storage, change out the ethanols, reduce the volume of ethanol uh, in the samples so to make it to meet shipping requirements um, and things like that. But all of that should be done by the time we um, finish our transit. Can we look at spiky thing, whatever that is? Um, So I suspect within a couple hours of being pier side, we can um, be off the boat and to the grocery store or whatever. So this is a type of bersingid. I'm used to them being um, redder than this. This lighter color bersingid is, I've seen them before, but they're a little bit rarer. And it's got uh, some kind of snail, gastropod, uh, hanging out um, just off frame right this second. But there it is towards the right. Oh, it's actually got two. There's one lower on it as well. Oh, yeah. I, think, I think that's all I need. Thanks. And then another one of those possible bushy hydrozoans. Yep. Good evening, Maldives. So for, um, you said that there's a lot of wear and tear offloading and reloading all the vehicles if the, like if the ROVs weren't permanently docked here. Is that the case with the Drix, who's coming on and off? It seems like every cruise or every other cruise i don't know enough about that system and how it's being used uh, what and what ccom is doing with it i did see a big 20-foot container with drix painted on the name drix painted on the side on the pier so it <laughs> might just be hanging out in the pier in between cruises but i don't know okay Um, I'm not sure if we can answer this question, but do we have like about how long ago the whale bone was collected for those online or the potential, the, the dead animal bone? What do you mean? How long ago? Uh, I think it so was then, like a week or two no, ago. No, 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 no. The one that we just found earlier tonight in the previous watch. I don't think we know that it's a whale bone. No, no, no. Yet. Potential animal. What is it? Eight hours? Yeah, about eight hours ago. Okay, so for those online who would like to backtrack it on YouTube, about eight hours ago. Hours. Thank you, Chris. No problem. The time was zero five or zero seven five zero was the UTC time. Sweet, thank you. Oh, thank you for your sweet comments from California.
this looks like that same sponge we've been generally calling polyopagon um, for most of this expedition but that one didn't have as obvious of attachment points so it might have been a little bit different another colophaca sponge coming up here kind of a cool view and from Atalanta of um, this pillow mound yeah and then Hercules it all coming up it yeah and it just kind of ends slime star and the mastus I believe oh still cool Yep. And a swimming polychaete. Thank you. I'm glad people are able to watch us as we're falling asleep. <laughs> Ooh, that's beautiful. All right, bone collection was four hours ago. Thank you, online viewer. Shrimp. So question about sponges. 
are there any encrusting sponges in the deep sea the way that like texas has the orange boring sponges boring because they bore into the rocks are there any down here in the deep sea or are they all like stand up tall sponges uh there definitely are some uh generally we find them in a little bit shallower waters uh than down here but when you get shallower than a thousand meters you definitely get start picking up really even shallower like five six hundred meters you start picking them up but yeah they definitely do exist um, encrusting sponges as a general rule are demo sponges, not hexaptinodes, and so down here is dominated by the glass sponges. Um, but once we start picking up m more and more diversity in the demo sponges as we come up, absolutely, we see a, a lot of encrusted sponges. Awesome, thank you. Two fossils collected? Okay, then that would make sense because I'm getting some viewers who are saying that it was four hours ago and then I'm having another one saying it's seven hours and 33 minutes ago. Okay, cool, so two different ones. So neat. I'm glad that uh, one of our online viewers bought a crocheted jellyfish from a local maker. So cool. And yes, Dave from Ohio, Seamount is just Seamount. What is this fish? Oh, Cuskill? Oh. Another little bottle brush uh, morphology thing. Can we get it, if we got the time, can we get a close look on the uh, fish head? This is the first one that we have, um, is showing us their head over on the right. Um, they have been showing us our tail, their tails almost exclusively this entire expedition and we haven't gotten a good shot of their head, which is where you make a lot of the distinction on these cusk eels uh, of what species they are. They are not cooperative when it comes to getting good looks at them. These obnoxious mobile animals that can swim away. Hmm. You can see the dots there on its lateral line above its um, pectoral fins. A nice view of um, the way it swims, undulating its kind of whole pectoral uh, dorsal fin. All right, that's probably good. Thank you. And a cuscale is not a true eel. Correct. So for anybody online that wants to learn more about sea mounts um, or about mapping and some of the underwater features, Nautilus put out a video last year called Five Fun Facts About Mapping, uh, and it gives a really good overview about some basics about mapping in the underwater terrain. I'm very biased because I made that video.
Abandon ship. Run, run. All right, that's good enough for me, thanks. I think we'll find another acorn worm up here. Decipher some more acorn worm crop circles. I kind of doubt it. Um, looking at the, the sediment up here, it's a much coarser grain. And I, given the density of the sea cucumber, both the sea cucumbers and the acorn worms on that finer grain, almost mud stuff, I think mm -hmm. this stuff just isn't as tasty, um, or what lives in it isn't as tasty because we haven't been seeing a lot of bioturbation period at this depth on this type of sediment, this expedition, compared to all of the sediment eaters we saw at the on our last watch. I think there's some kind of preference on sediment grain size and or depth. So I would be a little surprised if we saw um, an acorn worm up, worm up here, because they clearly liked whatever w the sediment we were in last night that looks different. Yeah, that was insane seeing so many of them. Hello, Singapore. Thanks for joining us. Question online about starfish. Uh, so shallow water starfish have light sensing organs, kind of like a little rudimentary eyeball at the end of each one of their arms. Do the deep sea sea stars have the same thing? I don't know. A lot of organisms in the deep sea um, still have their um, sensing organs if their evolutionary histories came from shallow water. Mm -hmm. um, but we are often unclear whether they um, work or they're still um, and whether they're useful for seeing bioluminescence or if they're what's known as a vestigial structure or an evolutionary relic that isn't helpful now but hasn't evolved away either. Um, so both are possible and I don't know right now on as a general rule on the brittle stars and the starfish where they fall in that category awesome thank you Lynette, I feel like you got your wish. You said you wanted just flat, open sand for miles. Love to see it. <laughs> I took your advice the other day and imagined sand flats when I was on the elliptical the other day. Ooh, how'd just, it go? Yep, cruising yeah. across the sand flats. <laughs>
I just keep hoping that all of a sudden we're going to see this Dumbo octopus just darting across the sand or some really, really crazy cool fish. Go, Lynette. Do a little pilot training while we're out here in the uh, sand. So question from Roy in Buffalo, New York. Uh, what are the sediments mainly composed of? Is it dead sea creatures, dead corals, marine debris? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a mixture of marine debris. Uh, there's microbes in there too. Um, there's also probably some quartz. Yeah, the Raman spectrometer guys were saying a lot of uh, silicate. Um, a lot of deep sea sediments are biogenic in origin. And we kind of are, we named them for where they came from, silicious ooze, carboniferous ooze, lots of different types of oozes. Calcareous um, ooze. Calcareous ooze. Um, so this particular spot, I don't know. Um, but I, uh, but yeah, a lot of them come from marine snow and phytoplankton skeletons. Why do they call them ooze? Don't know the history of that one. There's a very, there is a specific definition, but I forget what it is. Because when I think of ooze, I think of like mucus, like Nickelodeon slime kind of thing. So an ooze, by definition, is a sediment contained at le con contains at least 30% of the sediment is contained by skeletal remains of microplastic, uh, microplastic, microscopic organisms. Oh, there's not microplastics, but. <laughs> but given um, a lot of this came a lot of this comes from um, the remnants of the corals and stuff that used to live on the seamount as well so you this I don't know if this is gonna be um, predominantly biogenic in origin I suspect a lot of it is is basically beach sand um, that has been in this area since uh, it was created by corals and through other processes around the atolls um, that wouldn't necessarily qualify as an ooze Awesome, thank you. So we have a question online about um, viewing ROVs in kind of the off season. So yesterday you were saying that the Chinese has several ROVs in its fleet. There's Falcor 2, ONC. Are there any other ROV cruises that happen during like our winter months? So something maybe from the Southern Hemisphere, like Australia, South Africa? That are live streamed? Not a lot, no. So there's definitely, you know, there's thousands of RVs in the world, um, if you include all the industry vehicles and stuff like that. Um, but that live stream, 
No. Generally, the three vessels that live stream as a matter of standard practice are Falcor, Okeanos, and Nautilus. Um, a few others on a case-by-case -case basis will. ONC, um, Ocean Hours Canada, streams a lot of their stuff. They have deep sea stationary cameras that I believe stream all the time. Um, yes. And uh, Monterey, Bay Re Monterey Bay Research Institution Institute um, does stream on occasion, um, but but no, the, for the continuous like standard operating procedure live streaming their dives, it's really those three ships. Um, Awesome, thank you. One of Nautilus's major goals um, is also being as a training ship. So we take time to bring out um, interns and train them, and, and also, and it doesn't just start at the entry level. We try and continuously um, let people grow and expand their knowledge and capability, like we're doing right now with uh, our navigator Lynette in the pilot chair. So speaking of ROVs, Ren, I have a question for you. What is the deal with the upside down glass? Sorry, could you repeat that? Did I hear Ren? Yep. Uh, what's the deal with the upside down glass? The upside down glass, I'm not sure what. The thing right by your left hand, right above your, yes. Oh, this? Yes. Oh, I woke up a little bit late this morning and had to drink a glass of water and didn't have time to clean it. Oh no, I've seen it there for several dives, so I was just wondering. Well, that's this is not the first time that this happened. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if it was like for magnifying or if it was a special instrument that only a clear glass would do. Nope, it's not a scientific glass. <laughs> awesome, thanks Ren.
So this, <coughs> this is an anemone. <laughs> it's a little unusual to see them just out in the middle of the sand like this. Sometimes they'll have a polychaete or something like that living on, on their oral surface. So Dave, the deepest that Hercules can go is 4,000 meters, and the deepest that Little Herc can go is 6,000 meters. And we pushed both of them pretty close to that limit. Swimming shrimp. So since we're not seeing a lot of rocks in any of the sonars, do you want to start cheating southeast again and see if we can intersect something lower? If I'm misreading the sonar, that we can totally continue on this way. I'm just yeah, no, if, uh, looks like there might be something to the uh, Atlantis. I don't know that's... Yeah. Um, bridge now, Martina, can we move southeast, please? 50 southeast. Yeah, Roger. I should have told her cancel and then. Uh, yeah, she's. track line thing here. Um, it would be maintain speed, change bearing. Uh, 
How do you call it on Okanis, Brian? Call what? If you want to change your, uh, you know, change your course. So, the uh, there's a, a couple different ways to do it. Um, generally, we can move from present position or move from set point, and that's just two different ways of enter in, um, entering it. So. In that case, I would have, if I'd been navigating, I probably would have called and, and asked for a move 50 meters southeast from new set point, and so they would have updated the set point off, and it would have just uh, changed the yeah. vector and cut the corner, uh, as the way the ship would have moved. So instead of saying cancel the move, you say new set point. Yeah, or 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 you could say from present position do that, and that would cancel the move and then reposition it. Um, and, but I think that's a, a user interface on the Kongsberg KPOS system versus this one. It is, yeah. Um, they have to, uh, on this one, they have to hit, they have to stop the move, hit current, tell yeah. the ship to hold position, and yeah, enter all, a new move. On the KPOS, all the, all the different movements can be done from present position or present set point. And yeah. it's just a setting. Uh, or just a toggle on which way you're inputting the new move. You can also just drag and drop the uh, um, the set point on the display plot is another way to change the move. So you can, if you're not trying to be precise, you can just literally take the mouse and drag the set point where you want it, mm -hmm. and then the ship chases it. When you were working in industry, did you use a lot of follow ROV yeah. settings? Yeah, for days at a time. Yeah, my record is three. Three 12 hour shifts. Ouch. <laughs> so, this is a halosaur we're looking at right now, flying by. We uh, played with that. We never could get, we had a, uh, a s uh, track link USBL, and we could never get the track link to play well with the Kongsberg system. The Kongsberg system would only play with the Kongsberg yeah. USBL system, so we never tried it. But when we thought through it, we thought about switching USBLs, and then we're like, we really actually don't want to move a two-body system without paying attention, it being a conscious effort. So we never, we didn't pursue that very far. Yeah, we um, we do it with like 30 meters of tether out. And yeah. That's kind of our standard 30, 35, about this length. And depending on how tight you make the uh, follow ROV box, it, it does quite well. Here's our first, um, probably not our first on Balula, but the first one in a while. And our first sea pin in this particular sand patch. Oh, you're doing uh, no, great. That's, yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah, I, so I generally take the autos off whenever I want to do anything. Because the autos usually they fight back and and um, disrupt the visibility, especially the auto the auto uh, altitude. I need to see that on Balula. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I would like to fly by that sponge as we go if that's within range. My rise is not right now, but no, no, we don't. We don't need a close look. I'm pretty. I'm. I'm got a 90% sure what it is from this distance. I just want to confirm it as we fly past. Take, take, take your uh, auto altitude off. Um, yeah, no, you should be able to get there. So when you are stretched out, if you keep your tail pointed towards Atlanta and then use your laterals so you can, like, slide up the hill a little. That's when you're stretched out and you try and change your heading, it because the tether comes out of the back, it, then you start fighting it and you have to put in more commands and which um, kicks up the salt. So. 
Yeah, you are. There's some current there, so the laterals are really. Uh, there's not much lateral authority with Herc, especially into the breeze. Do you want to keep the ship moving, or? Yeah. Thank you. Horrible navigator. Bridge now five zero south east, please. Uh, five zero uh, one three five. Sorry. I gotta turn her down a little. She's loud. I don't want to mess with your settings here. It should float up, but it's actually thrusting down, so you can pull back on the. Yeah, typically you don't want to thrust up, but since we have 20% dialed down, Thank if you, you pull back on the stick, you'll see your little red lines disappear there. And that you're actually pulling back to go neutral, which is a really bad habit, but that's the way we roll on. Generally, if you trust up, it you know immediately trashes the biz. But if you gently pull back, it's counteracting your your down bias, and it'll float up gently. You're mm, fine. You're 20 meters away there. You should have enough leash to turn your head down and look at it. Turn your head and fly forward and that's planet in the sand there. So this is a big colophagus sponge that we're coming up on. It found its one rock out here in the middle of the sediment and colonized it. You can get, with the shadows and the light right now from where we're looking at, you can also see from the big rock in the background uh, a cool kind of the way the current moving around the rock has shaped it. You can see the scours around the top and sides and uh, a little accretion um, downslope of it, so it's a pretty consistent downward looking, downward flowing current here. Beginning to pick up a few more returns in the ROV sonars, indicating that there may be some more rocks coming. Woohoo! Yeah, you'll have to. Uh, You'll have to head back towards Atalanta now. So will turn to your right and go up the hill, I think. Question online about sonic anemometers. So they use sonic anemometers to get a third wind speed and direction on aircrafts and ground-based mobile labs. Um, is this and something that you could... Click heading there and then do yep. for under underwater yep and then we use the same principles um and then we just call them either an no. adcp an acoustic doppler current profiler or a dvl an acoustic uh, velocity law or That's doppler right. velocity law are the so. two um terms we use in the deep sea or in ocean science in general but it works on exactly the same principle Give some, just uh, different frequencies a little more ahead to play better we'll in the water get like instant relief awesome thank you
since it's benign out here, you can keep your head looking uphill and kind of grab to the left. The current might help you push you down the hill there. I don't know which way it's blowing, but. You can kind of crab and do, you know, hold some lateral in and a little head. If the current's favorable, it'll kind of walk at a 45. So if my very generous interpretation of the sonar reading in between the lines, pun intended, um, we should be about two thirds of the way through what I expect the width of this sand channel to be. But that is very much like the crystal ball interpretation of the sonar. Question online about the different roles that we have going on. Uh, so just inside the control van alone, we have a navigator, our ROV Hercules pilot, ROV Atalanta pilot, uh, video engineer, science communicator, geologist, biologist, data logger. And that's just inside the control van. That's not including the chefs, the mappers, the ship's crew, the captain, um, and a whole slew of others that make up the Nautilus. So, so many different career paths to go on to get here. I believe we have a total of 48 people on this expedition. So Chris, as we're moving across um, the sediment here, waiting to get back to the rocks, we, this is about as close as we've been to Palmyra uh, on the expedition and probably as close as we're gonna get. Do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, Palmyra and what it currently does and a little history? <coughs> sure, yeah. Um, so Palmyra is uh, a, an atoll that is comprised of about 30, 30 or so islands in a ring around a lagoon. Um, currently we have a research station that is manned by the Nature Conservancy and there's a joint collaboration or a collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife so they manage the refuge. So TNC or the Nature Conservancy um, has one of the islands where the station is at and then another island and then the Fish and Wildlife Service manages the waters and the refuge islands around the atoll. Um, at the research station, we kind of facilitate different groups that want to come down and use the facilities for research for their own projects. There's a lot of seabird monitoring and um, coral reef studies that are like ongoing projects, some of them going on as long, on as, long as 20 plus years. 
And what's your role there? Um, I'm the station manager, so I kind of make sure everybody's happy and communicate with Honolulu and coordinate all the projects, people coming down. Cool, thanks. But how long are you there every year, Chris? Um, so I'm there, it's, we do three month, uh, three month trips there, so I've been, I do two a year, so I do the spring and the fall, about three months at a time. Is there a, like a skeleton crew when you're not there? Um, no, it rotates, so the whole shift will rotate. So everybody that's there for the three months I'm mm -hmm. there will leave and a new team will come in. And gotcha. then it, it switches every three months. And you just couldn't stay away for your three months off and you had to get on Nautilus <laughs> and yeah. get close for another month and your month, three months off? Yeah, get as close as I can. <laughs> can we zoom sponge, please? I was really curious to see what the deep sea around Palmyra looks like because most of our work focuses on the um, the upper levels, so the terrestrial and the the reef areas around Palmyra. So it's really nice to be able to see what the deep deep water looks like around it. So this is a sponge group we have not been seeing as much. We've seen it a couple, but it's a little bit different. We're seeing, and you can see all those little pink dots. Those are actually anemones um, that are living in the tissue of the sponge and there are stick out their um, tentacles through the sponge skeleton, probably something in the family of Wardzelia, or Edwardzelia, Edwardzia, that's how you pronounce it. Sure. Oh, now we can see the little pink dots. Now you can get a good look at all the little um, commensal um, anemones. All right, that's good. Thank you. So we're going to gorge you here. Our first big coral in quite some time. Yeah. I think this is our first Aritagorgia of the of our watch. Yeah, I think you're right. So far, we haven't seen a lot of corals this watch, but almost all of them have been in the family Chrysogorgia day like this one. I think we've seen one, maybe two bamboos, and everything else has been a Chrysogorgia or something. Don't see any coral liverous jellies. I don't really see much. There's like one shrimp in there. All right, thank you. Really nice shot in the still cams as well. Hopefully that Aritagorgia is like a big hint of massive coral colonies to come. Well, generally these flanks of these features have kind of a, very much like a, um, oh, the word is eluding me, um, the ridge and channel kind of structure in shallow water reefs. If you're used to diving and fringing reefs, you often have a, a big blocky ridge structure and then a sand channel right next to it, and they kind of alternate. And in some ways, um, these seamounts have that kind of similar pattern around these edges as well. And so I think we were just crossing one of these sand channels, and we should get back up to a more rocky promontory structure here very shortly. Um, 
if I'm reading the bathymetry right. But we never know until we go and ground truth it, which is what we're doing right now. But we've also been cheating a little bit deeper as we've been transiting this sand channel, um, which will put us back more back on the slope and less on the top, which should give us a higher likelihood of some exposed rocks. like the sun is starting to come up outside. Yeah, when I ran out into the bathroom, you could just see it starting to come out, and it was gorgeous. Had the full moon on one side, had the sun just starting to peek out the other. Last night, they captured some beautiful sunset photos. Not much home on this rock. There's one little cup coral, and that's all I see. Check out the coral, please. This is a primnoid of some type, likely Norella, and it is just loaded down with um, wow, yeah. ophiocanthid uh, brittle stars. That's a heavy brittle star load for a mid-sized coral. Alright, I think that's all I need. Thank you.
quick zoom on the whip. So it looks like we got a little bryzoa here on the on the um, little one, and then uh, another one of these um, likely primnoid whips we collected earlier and on our last watch. All right, thank you. Got an anthemastis in the bottom left and another one of these kind of what we generally call, refer to as a bottle brush form of uh, Chrysogorgia. push in there for us. Good things. Another primnoid, not looking so not looking so hot. I'm excited we're starting to see coral again. Yep. Alright, that's good. Thanks. Okay, go away. Looks like we've got several dead stalks and a little baby Aritagorgia in here. starting to pop up. For those online, we are at about 1,800 meters down. I know the data online is down. They are trying to fix it from shore.
can't get enough of going north. Apparently not. <laughs> Now it has to come down. Okay. You don't need to spin. I'll come back under you. All right, everyone, I think we're going to um, recover a touch earlier than we had originally discussed um, according to the board. So let's aim for a surface time of 9 a.m. 9 a.m., Roger. Okie doke. So that would look like an off-bottom time of 7.45. That sound about right? Yeah, I think about 7.30. 7.30? Okay. Yeah. So we got one hour remaining in the dive. Thanks, Dwight. Stay looking south. Don't come around. Just put turns in. Fly by. This will be a cool, this could be a cool mosaic candidate. Um, this is sponge is stable enough that we could potentially do a really nice um, three dimensional build on on this sponge fly around. The stalks don't show up. Whenever I've tried to do one of these big stalk sponges and a and the spun the stalk for some reason doesn't come out real well. I get like a nice view of the rock, a really nice view over the head, and then it just looks like it's floating in space. Mm. Is there any special equipment that's needed to do the 3D mosaic? Uh, software. Um, yeah, the the kind of the industry standard of software package right now is um, yeah, uh, so called Metashape. Okay. But we don't have to do anything special on our side. You just do for, a little... For a simple one, no. Um, if we were going to be doing, um, like, science with it mm -hmm. we would need to put ground reference points down and scaling something to scale it with and there would be um you know we'd come at it from different angles and and be a little more methodical we'd, we'd probably do multiple pirouettes at different altitudes and stuff like that if i was going to really do a if i wanted to do a quantitative analysis on it i would need to have some quality control checks and stuff like that but for prettiness which like that would probably be sufficient to make a, a nice reconstruction. I just wouldn't be as confident about the scaling and all that that we would need to do science on it. This looks like another halosaur, which we've been seeing a fair amount of um, this dive. Has been sitting for too long. 
Question online, are there any times when a submersible would be preferable to observing the deep sea than a ROV system? There are certainly many people who would argue it's always preferable. Um, I have never had the pleasure of diving in a submersible. I have done all of my work with ROVs, so it's hard for me to comment, but I know the people who, I know many people who are big proponents of the human occupied vessels as well, our vehicles as well. Adam was saying it's a lot easier to determine the geology um, from a manned vessel than from mm -hmm. an ROV. That's what I heard too. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what every geologist says. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we could poke some rocks around here to see if we could pick one up? Dan, did you copy Corley? I did not. Uh, can we poke a rock or two and see if any of these are loose? All right. Yeah. Say anything that's loose. I might be able to break something off, but we don't have any rocks on the top, right? I don't think so. Yeah, let's let's give a break a try. All right. You had two rocks. Yeah. Wow, I'm just reading that batfish have a lure, just like all other anglerfish. Oh. Did not know that. One of those, or maybe something down there. Corley, you're very quiet. I'm having trouble even hearing you. Oh, uh, one of these maybe, or maybe something down there might be loose. 